you would open your Bibles this morning to the uh, first chapter of Hebrews. We'll begin our study of the book of Hebrews this morning. <clears throat> and I believe this will be a very interesting study because we'll be dealing uh, a lot with understanding the old law, which sometimes we don't know that much about. Um, and then also dealing with the, the new law, the law of Christ. And we'll talk about uh, some about Hebrews and a little bit of the background, uh, just a little bit to add to what we said last week before we begin this morning. I'd like to begin this morning with a word of prayer. I'm going to ask Brother Billy Wilburn, if he would, to direct our minds in a prayer as we begin the class. We talked about last week, the book of Hebrews is dealing with <clears throat> writings to a group of Christians. Um, it, it wasn't really sure exactly where this writing uh, to this group took place. Some think Rome, some think at least in Italy. There's some indications of that in, in the, the book itself. But uh, we're not really sure. We don't know who the author is. Some think Paul, some think Apollos. Uh, some think Barnabas. There's so many different people that they think could have written it. <clears throat> As we said last week, Paul typically signs his letters. And what I mean by that, it, he, he usually mentions himself in the introductory or in the conclusion that this is Paul, you know, and you know, I send my greetings and that kind of thing. So we don't see that in the book of Hebrews. So, so many think that, that Paul did not write it. It doesn't really matter who wrote the book of Hebrews because... Since we have it in the scriptures today, in, in the, the uh, scriptures that have been handed down through time to us, and, and by the way, that's not by accident. Uh, someone may claim that that's how they, we got them here, uh, but it, it's, a, it's along the same thinking of uh, the evolutionists with creation. It's just there was just a big bang and it happened. You don't have the, the, the scriptures together uh, as we do today by accident. If you look at people's lives, what they sacrificed to try to make it happen, how they were able to find things that had been lost and hidden and were able to uh, maintain those through the years and the strict um, guidance that was given by men even in terms of making sure that the scriptures were accurate to the original scrolls. There's just no, it's no accident what we have today. So the book of Hebrews is an inspired book even though we don't know who the author is. That doesn't matter that much. All that does is give us a little bit of flavor of who, who it was that wrote it and a little bit of the, their background so we understand a few things, but that's, that's not really pertinent in this book. And what we're dealing with here is Christians who obviously have come out of Judaism to obey the gospel of Christ, but we feel like that the timing of this book was written somewhere during the time of the persecution of the, the church uh, in, in Rome and, and maybe generally in Italy uh, by Nero, emperor of Rome. And we talked about that a little bit last week. Uh, Nero was um, somewhat of a heartless man. He would take Christians and dip them in uh, tar, uh, still alive, and hang them on poles and light them with them still alive to light the pathway into the city of Rome. So we know how devastating it would be for people to... Um, to be a Christian at this time. And so what we see here is that there are some thinking that, you know, if we abandon Christianity, if we go back to the, the law of Moses or the Mosaic teachings, 
then we'll be able to escape some of this persecution. And so there, there, there's some people who are thinking this and doing this. And um, so the writing to the Hebrews here uh, is strictly to that generation or to that uh, uh, group of people. It's not mentioned to the Gentiles. Um, and uh, for us today, maybe you know, we see some things that uh, are strictly associated with the law of Moses that wouldn't apply to us today. But we get the understanding of how important it is to know the teachings and to make sure we're abiding by those and why some of those exist and some of the blessings that come from that. The main emphasis in the book of Hebrews is to get the, these Christians to understand the improvement, the, it's hard to understand what, what word to use here, the betterment of the law of Christ compared to the law of Moses. And we're going to see that throughout the, the writings here in the book of Hebrews, how that the Christ law and his, his gospel and his, um, his kingdom is so much better than what they had on the law of Moses. And that's what we're going to be talking about here as we talk about the Hebrews. Um, that's the general purpose. If you look in your books on page 83, it says the purpose is to encourage the Jewish Christians not to go back to Judaism. And the book presents the better things in Christ. And that's what we're going to deal with. Now, as you open up your books, your, your Bibles, to Hebrews chapter 1, this is verse, uh, verse 1 and verse 2 that uh, would be good for you to commit to memory. And, and I don't know anything that gets your attention any more than to start a book like the way the Hebrews is started. And when you start talking about uh, God, as he talks about here, God, that's the first word, God. Now, what does that, what does that mean to you? What, what kind of attention do you get? If, if someone comes into the, uh, um, the classroom at school and, uh, you know, the, and they've been misbehaving, the teacher's out of the room, and look down the hall and the principal is coming. If they come in and if one of the students was just sort of proper and everything, and, and you, you, I'm sorry ladies, but you usually think about this as little girls because the boys were always misbehaving. But the girl, well, there, were, there was always a girl in the classroom said, you better behave because you know, you're gonna get caught or you're gonna get, get us in trouble or whatever. And what kind of attention did the, the class pay to that little girl? Usually not much, laughing and continuing to cut up. But what if she came in and she looked out the door and said, the principal is coming? What would the class do? Well, they, they'd find their seats in a hurry, wouldn't they? Well, when you start talking about a book that starts out with God, it has to get your attention. Now, we could sit here and spend months and months just on that one word, God. When you think about God, what, what comes to your mind? If you were a... Jewish Christian and you had come out of uh, the Mosaic teachings and you had been uh, involved in that for generations and someone came up and said God what would you do you would stop and pay a lot of attention you remember the commercial they used to put on television uh, Maybe you don't remember this, but I'll tell you about it. Um, if you don't remember it, that's okay. But there was a commercial where there was usually a, just a, a bus full of people or an office full of people, and they were just clamoring around, talking to each other, just loud and everything. And all of a sudden, over in the corner, there's a couple of people talking, and one of them says, well, E.F. Hunting is, is my adv ed financial advisor. And then everybody would just stop and say, you know, what's he fixing to say? And they'd say, well, when E.F. Hutton talks or something, everybody listens, right? Well, that's the way it is with God. When you start a conversation with God, I think people stop and pay attention. Even people in the world, if you were to say, God is, and then they'd say, you know, they'd turn and listen a little bit. So when you talk about God, you talk about all about God, the being of God, the nature of God. 
the power of God, the all-knowing aspects of God, everything about God come to your mind as you think about this. And as Jewish Christians being written to, they are going to listen to what follows because they started out with God. Now obviously they believe in God, they have served God uh, throughout their whole lives, don't know how old any of these people are. I would think that uh, most people that we, you know, when you write to a general population, you're going to get a, a scattering of age groups. But we have people here who understand the law of Moses, who understand God and the power of God and the nature of God. And so when he starts the book, he says, God, and that gives us the introduction that uh, is needed to talk to these people about the, the, the difficulties that they're facing and how they should deal with those. And so that's such a fitting and, uh, and, and an awesome way to start the writing of a book. God, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Okay? God is the one who had communicated with man. He's the one who had directed man. And they knew this. They knew before the law of Moses because of the stories that had been handed down, how that the, the God talked to their, their fathers, the heads of the household. We refer to this as the patriarchal age, the patriarch, the father of the household. This is who God talked to. So God who at sundry times, various times, different times, in divers manners, many manners. Uh, you remember the, um, um, some of the, the, the dealing either with Christ or um, I think it was the one where, where Christ came into the man in the, um, the tombs that was um, sort of a maniac. And uh, he, they talked about the demons that were in him. I believe that's the one. And what did he say is, he said that there, we are called legions because there are many. And so when we use the word divers sometimes, there, there was an example where he had divers spirits. And uh, we use the word divers to mean many. So that's what he's saying here. God who at various times, sundry times, and in divers manners, spake in times past unto who? The fathers. And uh, he did this initially talking to the fathers in the patriarchal age. But then after that age, what did he always send to talk to the, um, the, the, the people? A prophet. Um, you know, and as we look at that, sometimes we had judges who were sort of prophets. They were given God's message. A prophet is someone who's a messenger of God. So we had the judges. We had all the prophets. And we think about all those during the Old Testament times. They came and they spoke to the fathers. Okay, so that's the way it was. But then we turn to, to verse 2. And he says what? He hath in these last days spoken to us by his son. And so here is the distinction. Here's the distinction. God sent a representative that was a being upon the earth that was a human being that was not divine other than you might say angels who were messengers at times but now God is sending his only begotten son to speak to us now just on the surface if you had a prophet from God come speak to you or you had the son of God come speak to you which one would you tend to pay more attention to son of God as a little bit more prominence there, you're close to the throne. It's like a, a kingdom. If, if a, a king of a kingdom sent a messenger from, from him that said, uh, you know, this or that or whatever, people would pay attention. But if the, son's, the king's son came and actually spoke the message, what a difference that would make. So now what he's pointing out initially here is that God has always spoken to us. He's done it through the prophets. But now he is speaking to us right from his son. And so he says here, He hath in these last days 
uh, spoken to us by his son. Now, notice, notice, notice his credentials, as it were. You know, if you uh, usually come bring a message from the king or if you were a prophet of God, uh, sometimes God will give them the ability to do things that would make people pay attention. Uh, we know, for example, Samuel, some of the things that Samuel did. And so we see that there are situations here uh, that <clears throat> give some credentials about them being there. Um, but now here's the Son of God. Now what, what are his credentials or what are some things that we know about him? He says, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Now in the world that we live in, we know what an heir is. An heir is someone who is going to take over or receive all the benefits of someone when they die. And here he says that Christ has been appointed heir of all things. So from, a, from an authoritative standpoint, what does that say? Here's God who's spoken to us in, in the times past through the prophets, but now he's speaking to us through his son, and why should we point, you know, why should we pay attention to him? Because he's appointed him heir of all things. It is as if Jesus is speaking with, with God being there, or is as if God were there. And so this is why he has the credentials, this is who he has appointed in place of the prophets, and people are supposed to hear him. On the Mount of Transfiguration, you remember the story there where uh, Jesus took his normal Peter, uh, James, and John with him uh, to the Mount of Transfiguration, and they, you know, Peter, uh, impetuous Peter as he were, was always the case. He would stood up and say, hey, God, it's, it's just great for us to be here. Why don't we make a tabernacle to Moses and one to Elijah and one to Jesus? That sounds reasonable, doesn't it? They're all there, you know, it's, they're overwhelmed by their presence, and as Peter just, out of excitement, says, why don't we do that? And God says, this, representing his son, as if it were pointing to him, highlighting him, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. And so this was the first indication that we have that God expected men under the time of Christ to listen to him, not the prophets, not the other people who had come before, although they were good representatives, messengers from God. Now we're supposed to listen to Christ. Okay, now that makes a difference. And so um, here he has appointed him heir of all things, and also he says, by whom also he made the world. And so we see from this passage and also in John 1 and in 1 John 1, what? That Jesus was the Word and that the Word was responsible for what? The creation of the world. And so once again, here's the writing that says, this is the Son of God. He's been appointed heir of all things. All means everything. And not only that, but he is the one who made the world. So if you talk about a prophet that came from God, who was a messenger, who on occasion might have an ability to do something to, you know, confirm that they were actually from God, who had some ability or could do some kind of miracle or sign or something, as opposed to the one who is the heir of God, and that's hard for us really to comprehend what, what all that's about. But he's the heir of God, but not only that, he is the one who created the world. So if, you, if you're talking about who do I listen to, if, if there's confusion about what do I listen to, continue to listen to Moses and the prophets, or do I need to listen to this son of God? That right there should answer that question. Because of the credentials that Christ comes with, there's no, uh, no way that that has anything to do uh, with comparing what, what should be listened to. You're going to listen to the Son. And, of course, we know that's 
the intent of the Father, as we said, from the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, he's going to give us a little bit about Christ here to make them sort of set up and take notice or pay attention to what's being said. So he continues to talk about Christ and explain to them what it is that makes him better or what it is that he has over others that might have been messengers from God. It says, who being the brightness of his glory. And, and when you hear that, what, is, what comes to your mind? The brightness of his glory. When Moses asked to see God, do you remember the story? Moses asked to see God. God said, no one sees the face of God and what? And lives. But Moses was able to see the hind part of God. We don't know what that means, other than the fact that maybe he, he was present there and he was going away. And so Moses saw God as he went away. And that's all he did. When Moses came down from the mount, what was the story? His face shone such that the people could not bear it. And all Moses had ever done was seen God as he was going away. Now, think about that in terms of Christ, who he says, who being the brightness of his glory. Now, I don't think that means that Christ came down to the earth and was shining so brightly that no one could see him. But sometimes we use the uh, terminology uh, here on earth that that child is the spitting image of their father or something. What does that mean? He looks like him, maybe even acts like him, has the characteristics. So here's Christ who is on earth and came to this earth, and that's the story that's being told to the Hebrews here. Here is the Son of God who I want you to listen to, but, but listen to this. He is, the, he is the very image, the brightness of God. Now, nobody could come and speak and present themselves in those regards. People could come and say, I'm a messenger from God, and God's given me this message, and He's also given me this ability. I can show you that I'm from God. But nobody could come in the brightness of the glory of God except for his son. And so you're beginning to see why it is so important to listen to Christ. He is the source. You know, if, if we have somebody that is uh, been diagnosed with a very uh, significant illness, okay, no offense to doctors in Huntsville, but if you knew someone who was studying this particular thing in John Hopkins or some other well-known research hospital throughout the world, would you go to those in the city of Huntsville who have heard about it and maybe have read a few things about it? Or would you go to the one who's been working on that illness somewhere? Well, we know the answer to that. And so here is Jesus, this very image of, this, of God, and in the presence of mankind has presented God's message. So here he is, the very the, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. There is the authority of Jesus. Jesus didn't come as a representative. He didn't come as a messenger. He came with all authority uh, from God. What did, what did uh, Jesus say about himself in uh, Matthew 28 and verse 18? All power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All power. It, it wasn't as if, well, God has sort of divided the power here, and I have half the power. No, 
God had given him all power. And he had all power and therefore all authority to speak for God. And so he says here that he is the very image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins. Now that is a significant thing to talk about with the Hebrew people. We've talked about this before. We're going to get into it some more in some of the later chapters. But we'll bring it up here just to make the point. What's the significance of them, him being able to purge their sins? You that know the Old Testament law, what is the significance of that? They never had their sins forgiven under the old law. If you look at the teachings of the old law, when the people would come and offer their sacrifices and they would have the scapegoat that the, that the priest would make an offering and send it out into the wilderness, the, the, the idea there was that that scapegoat was carrying the sins of the people away out into the wilderness. But the symbology there is so truthful. It went out into the wilderness. It did not take those sins away. Okay? And so here the point is being made that here is the one who came who actually could take the sins away. And so this is a very important part of what he's trying to get them to understand. He had all power. He had the authority. When he by himself purged our sins, then what did he do? He died. No. He disappeared. No. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. What happened to Moses? What happened to Samuel? What happened to Nathan? What happened to Isaiah? What happened to Elisha? They all died. Now we know about Elijah, and uh, we know about um, him being taken away, but men, no matter how great they were upon the earth, they all physically died. But Jesus took his place on the right hand of God, the majesty on high. And so, two verses into this letter that's being written, two verses, should be enough to convince somebody that if I have a choice of listening to the law of Moses or the teachings of those who followed that taught the law of Moses and the Judaism uh, that, that came from that, or I listen to Christ, the answer would be hands down that Jesus is the representative of God, the very image of God, the brightness of his glory. He's sitting on the right hand of God. He is in a place of authority. And we should listen to him. That, there it is in a nutshell. Two verses. But there is a lot more to be said. And there obviously are a lot of things that happened under the law of Moses that people probably keep thinking back to. Well, you know, what about this and what about that? And there's so many things that are going to be addressed that we'll get into all that, but two verses into Hebrews should have been enough to say that we should listen to what Christ said and we should follow him. But we'll move on. Now, continuing to talk about him. Uh, being made so much better than the angels. Now, here again, you have a representative come to you from God that is a man that lives upon the earth. The tendency sometimes would be for people to rise up, and it, it happens, it has happened in history, and they rise up and say, Well, you're just a man. You're no better than me. You're just a man. Why should I listen to you? And, and so that, that is. Uh, Certainly something to take under consideration, but what happens when an angel comes? Now, obviously, you're dealing with someone who's not an earthly being. 
You recognize that right off the bat. Now, I don't know how angels appeared. I do know that they could appear as regular people as they came and talked to Abram when he was going to have a, a child and they came and talked to him and they sat down and had a meal with him. So I, I know they can, can present themselves in uh, at least a, a, a fashion that you don't recognize them. The Bible says uh, in, in, one, in one occasion it says Be, beware that you don't entertain angels unawares. And so in other words you may have somebody come to you that looks just like a human being. Maybe an angel can do that. I don't know. But if they presented themselves in their angelic form, then I do know that there's something different about that. Uh, angel appearing to Zechariah who said, you're going to have a son, you're going to name him John. Uh, angels appeared to Joseph and, uh, and given him instructions and things like that. So these beings um, could have an earthly form, but we think of them as being, um, you know, heavenly in nature, and that uh, so they may may present themselves when they are messengers specifically on occasions as something that is different than what man has used used to seeing. And, and so, what about that? What about when the angels come? Well, he says here, being made so much better than the angels. Um, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Because an angel, no matter how, um, how do you say it? No matter how good they were or whatever, they were God's messengers. They were God's servants. And Jesus is not a servant of God. He is his son and he has the inheritance. And it says here that he has obtained that inheritance when Jesus came to this earth and did what God wanted him to do the will of the Father including his death upon the cross so that we might have forgiveness of sins through the blood that was shed and salvation that comes with that he fulfilled what God wanted him to do and he took his rightful place at the right hand of God and so he has obtained then a more excellent name because of him being able to obtain the inheritance through the obedience which he, uh, in, he went through for us on the cross. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will say to him, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When has he ever said that to an angel? Wasn't going to, and he hadn't. And this just shows us that Jesus was the Son of God. And uh, from a perspective that we understand of a kingdom, he had an appropriate place at the right hand of God. The angels did not have that. They were messengers, and they were servants of God. And so he's never said that to an angel. You know, you're, you're my son. Uh, this day have I begotten thee. And um, some other things we see from Psalms uh, chapter 2 and other passages, maybe Psalms 89. So we see here that uh, uh, a, a continuation of that. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he said, and let all the angels of God worship him. If the angels were going to be the ones that they wanted to listen to, then God would have stopped right there and said, well, I'll just send angels. But God sent his son. And when he sent his son, he intended that everyone would listen to him that he was far above the angels. And uh, they, they, were, uh, they were there, and they, they worshiped God, and they were his messengers. So he says here again, when he bringeth forth the firstborn of the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits or winds, and his minister a flame of fire? He uses his angels in whatever way he intends to use them as spirits or for vengeance. And they, they were there to, to do his bidding. Uh, and that's not the way the Son is described here. Uh, but unto the Son, he says, verse 8, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A, a scepter of righteousness is the, is the scepter of thy kingdom. And so he says, he, he recognizes him as God. 
as being part of the Godhead. But unto the Son, he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So we see the writing here that is given all the evidence that, that God's Son is superior to anything that God has sent before. Okay? And then he continues on, verse 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hath laid the foundations of the earth. Again, letting us know that, that Jesus was the, uh, the force behind the creation of the worlds. And we know he spoke it into existence in Genesis 1. Uh, thou, Lord, in the beginning hath laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hand. Now they shall perish... But okay, these things were great. These were magnificent. I don't know if you've looked at the moon the last couple of nights. I mean, it's hard not to when you look outside. You say, who left the outside lights on? You know? It's so bright. It's so big setting up in the sky. And so when you look at that and you envision that that is just unbelievable because it's something that's out there floating around like us. It's big and it is impressive and there's so many stars that are out there. You look at what God has done and you think how great these things are. But notice what he says here. These things shall perish, but thou remainest. Better hold on to what's going to stay anchored. Right? Hold on to what's going to be anchored. And um, sometimes we think, well, nothing's going to ever come along that's going to pick, pick this up. You know, and then we experience a, a massive flood. I've watched on television where those houses, the water just erodes away, and then all of a sudden they just float over into the, the river, you know, and there it goes. You know, a million dollar house. Why? Well, who would have ever thought that that thing would be destroyed by floating down the river? Or who ever thought that a tornado would take a house away? So we know that these things uh, are temporal, and we know that we better anchor into those things that are eternal. Well, God's Son is eternal. He's not going to perish. Uh, he says, they, they shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And when we have a garment that's old, it just starts tattering and tearing, doesn't it? I mean, you just cannot keep something forever. And so these things are going to go away, and that's what he's trying to impress upon them. You need to anchor into something that is eternal, and that is the Son of God. And he says, as, a, as a, a vesture or a mantle, shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Here again, the eternal nature of the Son of God. And then verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool? What angel, no matter how prominent they may be, and I don't know that angels have you know, levels of authority. I guess they do. I don't know. But when did he ever say, you've just really been a great angel. I want you to sit on my right hand. Didn't happen. And so to Christ he did say, sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And they not all ministering spirit sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. They not all ministering spirit sent forth to minister or do service for the sake of them that shall be heirs of salvation. When the angels came 
to this earth. In man's way of thinking, he could have said, well, you know, I'm down here as a representative of God. You know, that's pretty important. I mean, are any of us, in the sense that angels were, uh, on a level of representatives of God? Now, I know today we're all ambassadors for Christ. We have a, a mission to fulfill. We are his representatives. We are his messengers upon the earth because there's no one else to do it. It's been given to our hands to do. But the angels came from God. I've just come from God. Here's the message. But listen to what the message was all for. Who were they for? What were the angels coming to do here upon the earth? Why were they talking to men? Just have, you know, not, not so much else to do. Here I am to talk to you. No. They came as representatives of God, but what was the purpose of them coming to be representatives of God throughout the ages? Now, it may not have been apparent until the time of Christ, but why were they here talking to us? So that we could be heirs of salvation. And the angels don't have that. Even in their prominent position, their prominent position of being representatives from God and living in the realm that God lives in, they came down here to help us to become these heirs of salvation. And so when you, when you see that, and you understand the place that they took or they were, they were put into, even men, in terms of what God is doing for us, is above the angels. And that may sound a little strange to you, but Paul talks about it. If we are, if we're, if we're the, the Sons of God, then we are heirs according to his promises and joint heirs with Christ. So even a spiritual being from God, you know, mankind with all his feebleness and all his fumbling around, they came to serve us so that we could be heirs of salvation. So when you look at all that, the, the, the message here in chapter 1 is so powerful in terms of who we should listen to. And it's obvious that it has to be Christ, the Son of God, the creator of the world, the one who did the Father's will, who is now in the, sitting on the right hand of the throne of God, He's making intercessions for us. He is there to plead our case. And we should listen to what he has told us in his teachings. Now, hopefully as we get in to more of the discussion in the chapters that follow, that we'll begin to understand and we, we want to make this quite plain is the fact that the law of Moses was not something that man devised. It was not something that was um, not appropriate. But the Hebrews need to understand that it was there for a particular period of time for a purpose that would go away. And yet, being steeped in the teachings uh, year after year and generation after generation of what the law taught, they were very in tune with what they had been taught and they believed it. And so now that they're Christians and things are happening, there's some doubt maybe in their minds. And so we need to, to understand the purpose of the law of Moses and the fact that it was not it was not in competition with the law of Christ. 
and it shouldn't have been made that way. It should have been understood that it was in place for a period of time, and then when that period was fulfilled, then it no longer was in effect. And that's how they should have understood it and then transitioned to the law of Christ. Quite obviously, you could see some difficulty with that. And, you know, I'll make this analogy. I have known people, and I'm not just picking this out, but just I've known people of the Catholic faith, for example, who have been taught and have been indoctrinated from the time that they were able to walk of what the doctrine teaches, and it's difficult sometimes for them to understand the difference between what they've been taught by man and what the scriptures actually teach because they've been taught so well. It's ingrained in them. And so you have to understand a lot to be able to uh, maybe let go of that. And some people have difficulty with that. And that's just an example. But there, the, the credit, not necessarily good credit, but the credit of the teaching that took place for people who were raised in that faith was pretty intense. And now it's difficult for maybe to understand the truth of the scriptures. But the point I'm making is this is the kind of thing that was ingrained in them. And so it has to sort of come out. Even though they've obeyed the gospel, it's hard for them to let go of something that they've lived their whole life doing. Could you imagine that? You've lived your life 80 years and now the gospel comes along and how do you get all that 80 years of teaching out of you, you know, without having a lot of understanding of the gospel? We'll continue on next week as we get into chapter 2.